I'm Bridget Berger, and this is my husband, Alan, and we were in the class of 2007, so we've been around for a little while, and um, Dr. Rush Maje is with us. He's right there on my screen. <laughs> Here? <laughs> yep, and um, hopefully y'all have had a chance to watch the videos. So I'm going to put a poll it is set up to be anonymous. I'm gonna launch this poll and I want people to answer. Now, again, it's anonymous. Um, I wanna know how many of the pre-recorded videos you were able to watch in their entirety. And uh, there's gonna be a follow-up question as to why. So go ahead and click on the answer and I won't, be able to see who's responding what. So just be honest. We just want to know how, you know, if time allows that sort of thing, uh, how this all, because this is all new to us. And this is brand new as far as uh, the in, uh, initial training, how, how we've done that. Okay. So I'll give it just, uh, we have 10 of 13 people voted. Uh, we, we voted uh, too. I hope that didn't just so uh, you know. Yeah. And, <laughs> and if I could also interject that when we do the evaluations, we're going to be very interested in what people think of this format compared to what we've done before, of uh, whether they like the ability to watch the pre recorded. Um, content a little bit more leisurely on their own time. And then tonight, we're going to dedicate more time to just interacting and asking questions and having a discussion. So we're really interested in um, what people think of this format. Okay. And you know, uh, what I neglected to tell you and Sally is that um, I have, you know, I've printed out the evaluations for the students, but I added some very specific questions to the back of the evaluation about the pre-recorded sessions and also about my presentation that I'll be giving tonight. So it's kind of a, so just three extra questions uh, so we could see how well that worked. Excellent, okay. thank you. Okay, all right. So here, can y'all see the, um, the polling results? Yes. You see that? Greg and Sally, you, I don't yes. know if you can see that on your phone. Okay. Now let's see. Okay. All right. So now I have one more follow up question. Let's see, let me close that. And, uh oh, relaunch polling. Nope. Okay, let's see. Polls. Oh. How come I can't? Oh, here we go. Here we go. I got it. All right. Here. Here is the second question. If you were not able to complete the videos, what prevented you from doing so? and select the all that apply. Because we know people's lives are busy. We know, you know, sometimes videos aren't the thing for you, that sort of thing. Technical issues. Russ just told me how AT&T has been out to his house for three days, and, <laughs> <laughs> right? So we know, we just wanna uh, <clears throat> gather some information. So um, just answer honestly, again, this is anonymous, so I won't see who's answering what. Uh, we just wanna know what, what uh, prevented you from completing the videos, okay? I watched a couple of them twice. Does that, oh. does that- <laughs> Extra point. Make me a science nerd or what? I loved him. That's great, thank they you. They were the best lectures. I wanted to know if it was okay if I shared them with my friend, a few of my friends that would they really- are, They're enjoy. public. They, the, oh, our okay. YouTube channel is public. So okay. yes, yeah, you can share them. Um, okay, I'm gonna end the polling. 
And I'm going to share the results just so you can see. <coughs> and Okay, so just too busy, you know, we live busy lives. I totally understand. Okay, I just got to download that. All right. Okay. Can, so, can, you, can you hear me? Yes, go right can ahead, Russ. Make a quick comment. I, I want to apologize because Bridget asked me to have those ready a week, at least a week before she put them out. And I just kept having glitches. I had to get a new microphone and whatnot. But at any rate, I I'm, I'm responsible for the fact that you only had them for a few days. So I apologize. Well, listen, I <laughs> want everyone to know, I had no idea that you could actually record like Russ did. I mean, he figured all that out. I had no idea you could do that. And um, we converted it all to video and uploaded it. And I think it is the best thing since sliced bread, but <laughs> um, okay. Thanks. So um, moving on, um, I only got questions from one person. And he, uh, I asked if you guys would send me your questions from the video so that Russ could look at them ahead of time. Um, and Sarah did send three questions. Um, and we'll have Russ uh, take a stab at those now. So oh, I have some too. I just oh, good, didn't good. get them in the thing in time. Um, I okay. Was okay. Well, let's do Sarah's first and then we'll do a round robin and see if anybody else has some questions. So the first question was, in our chapter area, what would you consider an extreme, extremely healthy estuary and also what would be an example of a weakening or falling estuary? Can you address that, Russ? Yeah. Um, is there a way for me to come on, or can they see me in the? They can see uh, you. I'm on. I'm as big as you are to me. So. Well, it depends I'm on how you have your box. view set, but yeah, everybody okay. can see you. Everybody can see me. Yeah, I'm gonna made a couple of notes here. Um, you know, uh, I guess to start off with, I would say that uh, we don't really have any really um, totally degraded estuaries. If, if we had any at all uh, that I could select on the Texas coast, it would be Galveston Bay. And, and that's pretty self-explanatory. Uh, you know, it's, it's very industrialized. Uh, highly populated, a lot of runoff, both locally as well as um, industrial effluent sewage treatment plants. All the things that I referenced in as far as affecting water quality. When we get down, the question was in, in our chapter area, I looked at uh, pretty much San Antonio uh, Bay, I would consider. Uh, the Guadalupe Estuary, for uh, which is San Antonio Bay Area, I would consider probably the, the most pristine. It has a relatively um, um, what well, has the two watersheds that I think I think we showed that on the on the um, those two watersheds as an example when you go to the uh, follow the stream deal. But at any rate. Um, of the of the three, I would consider that probably the the, the healthiest in the long run. Um, as far as a, a weakening or a failing estuary, I would say we don't really have any in our area or even on the Texas coast. Uh, if I had to make a choice in our area, I would say the Nueces estuary, and I would say that because, as you saw in the video, as we went from the upper Texas coast down to the tip of Texas, uh, the estuaries got increasingly salty. And, and uh, actually, <clears throat> even though I know better, I always think of, of freshwater inflow being a, a major um, 
problem as far as our Texas estuaries, but it's really only a problem when you get to Corpus Christi Bay and the Laguna Madre. Uh, I went back this afternoon and checked a few uh, um, online sites and, and it looks like all the other estuaries um, actually have sufficient freshwater inflow to meet what the state of Texas has determined should be the appropriate inflow into those respective estuaries. So, um, you know, we could have occasional pollution problems. Obviously, even north of here, uh, north of Corpus Christi, we're gonna have drought conditions, which is gonna affect the salinity negatively in, in a lot of the estuaries, but there, there's nothing you can do about that. Um, we're a little bit unusual here in, in the Corpus Christi Bay area in that we've got two reservoirs on our, on our river input. And um, obviously those, those are there because we're in a, a drought prone area and we literally need those reservoirs if we want drinking water <laughs> you know, every, every summer. So um, there again, um, if we had to pick of, of the four estuaries, the Matagorda, uh, San Antonio, Aransas Mission, uh, Aransas Bay and Corpus Christi, I would pick Corpus Christi Bay to be the, the, the worst of the two or the, the least healthy only because we have quite frequently relative to the other estuaries in the area, we quite frequently have drought situations. Every bit of river water coming in is retained in those dams. Um, I will say also, I don't think it was necessary, I don't remember if I put anything in there in the presentation about it, but our estuaries, in addition to a, a total inflow that's recommended by Parks and Wildlife and the Water um, PCEQ uh, to maintain healthy estuaries, and that's a law now. Uh, it wasn't until, what, back in 97 uh, with Senate Bill 1, where they actually um, included freshwater inflow to estuaries as part of a critical use of, of river water. Um, I think the legislature um, up until that time, by and large, except for a, a few exceptions, considered uh, that uh, any, any drop of water that entered um, an estuary was any drop of fresh water was wasted. Um, so, uh, which is a common attitude today, believe it or not, uh, on the coast. So, um, Anyway, the second one, what are the ways we can help improve our estuaries <clears throat> in terms of pollution and mitigating climate change? Um, well, I would say as far as pollution, um, locally, um, you could uh, embark on something that, that seems really simplistic, but, but I think it's been very effective and that's stenciling storm drains in your, in your um, particular coastal town because all of those drains do go directly into the lowest part of your community, which is gonna be whatever basis you're living around. Uh, and, and I mention that because we, when I was routinely taken students out on our teaching vessel and we would pass the storm drains coming into Corpus Christi Bay. They didn't have a clue what they were there for. And when we asked them, where do those holes on the side of the street go? They said, oh, well, that goes to the same place where when you flush your toilet. And, and so, um, you know, I, and I know you all have too seen people uh, routinely blow their lawn clippings down there. I've seen people drain their oil. Uh, right over one of them so they didn't have to take a pan <laughs> and, and then go and dump it. So, you know, that's, it. again, it's pretty simple, but it's something that's easy to do and it's very effective and they've got all kinds of 
little stickers that you can buy or little plaques that you can glue on there. It says it's drained directly to the bay. You know. Um, let's see. As far as also locally, I guess what a lot of folks think about pollution, they think about industrial effluent. So if you've got an industry that wants to locate um, on the particularly or estuary that you're interested in or live around, um, that um, you want might want to make sure that what they're doing isn't sure going to result in any toxic effluent. And if that might be the case, that they be um, required to monitor that effluent for its toxic um, no, Formosa okay. has been a good example. I think we just didn't they just resolve a, a Formosa case, Bridget, recently? Or Alan? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yep. That was, so, that was know, about the Nurdles. Yeah. 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 Go ahead. Can I interject? Um, Please. That uh, just whether we have any updates, anybody knows about the Sentin steel plant. Um, we understand they're, uh, they're going to flow into Copano Bay, and we understand that their wastewater uh, permit first time through was rejected. Um, and, and so they've had to go back to the drawing board on, on their permit. Do we have any um, information on that? You know, I, I, I have not, I'm, I'm aware of that steel plant. <laughs> I, it never occurred to me that, that they would have a, uh, an effluent thing. I, I, would, I just assumed all of their effluent was gonna just be in the form of heated water that's, that's used for cooling. But I, I guess they certainly could have some, some uh, heavy metal contaminants uh, going into, uh, into Copano Bay. I, but I haven't, I haven't uh, followed that. I've been following the, the desalination uh, plant proposals that Carpets Christie, they've got three different sites um, currently um, under consideration. Well, I guess two now. I think they finally dropped the one on, on Harbor Island. But uh, so anyway, yeah, just as you're doing, keep, keep up keep aware of what's going on um, in, in your area that could affect uh, your particular estuarine system. Um, I guess one other thing, and I, and I hate to, I'm, I'm preaching to the choir here, I'm sure, but you know, any, um, any opportunity that you can take or afford to take uh, to, uh, to encourage more, um, green energy production, whether it's solar panels, windmills, whatever. You know, every, every time we have a, um, or every, every power generating plant uh, does a couple of things, whether it's nuclear, whether it's um, uh, conventional fossil fuel uh, operated, the, um, there's, there's a, a problem with intake and outflow just for cooling water, and and uh, that cooling water has, as, as you saw in the uh, in the present some of the presentations, if you got to them on the on the marine life, we've, most marine life is so tiny, uh, both the eggs and when they hatch out as larvae, they're going to get entrained in any kind of a of a cooling water intake system, and and they're not going to come out alive on the other end. When you look at the volumes that they use. It, it's um, it's substantial. So again, that would be um, um, oh, that's my phone buzzing. That would be a, a another uh, concern that I would have as far as as far as climate. One other thing um, that you might want to keep in mind is, you know, most of climate change. Um, in the atmosphere is due to carbon dioxide, even though methane is much more uh, important as a greenhouse gas, there's not that much of it relative to 
to what comes out the tailpipes and and so and the power plants, not so. Um, one thing that I don't think I mentioned was that we got a a two-edged sword with carbon dioxide. We not only got atmospheric warming, but we got uh, which results in the uh, glaciers melting, and we're we're seeing definite sea level rise, but. One of the thing that happens is carbon dioxide is extremely soluble in, in uh, water, seawater or freshwater either. And as it dissolves, it, uh, it reacts chemically with the water, unlike oxygen and nitrogen, it reacts chemically and forms carbonic acid. So now we're seeing uh, in certain, uh, particularly areas around coral reefs, where just very minor, or even hundreds, the pH change is detrimental to, to those reefs. You might think, well, my God, look at the volume of the oceans. How could you affect all of it? You don't have to affect all of it. You just affect the top part of it where things are photosynthesizing or where coral reefs exist. Then uh, we've got enough carbon dioxide going to the atmosphere that, that uh, I think we're going to ultimately see some um, some detrimental effects there. So again, anything we can do to reduce that will, will not only help, help the planet's atmosphere, but, but oceans as well. And the last one, I don't have that much on. I, I went back and looked at some of, the last one is, does agricultural runoff greatly impact our estuaries in the area? And, and I had a slide or two, I think, I didn't take it out for time's sake on sedimentation from agricultural runoff and its effect. Was that still, do you recall, Bridget, was that still in the final cut? I don't recall. Okay. <laughs> well, at any rate, um, one of the benefits, well, yeah, two of the benefits, freshwater inflow to estuaries is uh, the supply of nutrients and the supply of sediment. But in both of those instances, you can have too much of a good thing. You have too much nutrient coming in with river water and uh, runoff from the surrounding estuarine area, as well as return flow from sewage treatment plants. And you've got too much nitrogen and phosphorus resulting in, in algal blooms, which, which are harmful. Um, you got too much sediment coming in, you can, you can literally overwhelm the system, smother uh, vent mechanisms and, and cause a problem then because there's so much settle out as it typically does uh, when you got a more quote normal river flow coming in. And I do think I showed the, I hope I left in the part about how clay flocculates when it gets into the estuary or maybe I pull that one out too. <laughs> At any that rate, stuff, Russ, Russ, that stuff was all in there. Oh, thank you. Yeah. See, Bridget, you didn't watch it. <laughs> thank you. I, I, like I said, I, those things were so long and, and just, I was going, running on and on. So I, I had to go back and start selectively pulling out slides. So I'm glad I left that one in there. But at any rate, I went back and looked at, at land uses in the various watersheds are the estuaries in our area. And agriculture does not um, use that much water. Now, that's not to say that with rainfall with, with runoff from row crops, it's not gonna um, contribute a lot to sediment, but, it, but most of that sediment, at least it's been my experience here in 45, 50 years, drops out when it, when it hits the estuary pretty quickly in farms of Delta. Very productive areas, the deltas uh, in, the, in the mouth, the rivers that are, that are coming into farming estuaries. So a, a little is a good thing, a whole lot in a big pulse is, is not such a good thing, but it eventually will drop out. That's why you don't see um, high turbidity estuaries along the Texas coast that are due to sediment. The, the, you do see some high turbidity estuaries that are due to dense phytoplankton. Um, 
So those were her three questions. Um, I have here? one. Well, yes. Yeah, let's open it up to, to more questions. Go ahead. Um, yes, on that one, um, I, I think it was the um, estuaries part two, there was a, or maybe one, you had a, um, a slide about farmers that were, um, they drain and fill to be more productive on their property. And um, so are they still doing that even though that now that they know that that's really not environmentally, you know, um, advantageous to the environment or is you know, that just something that they have to do because of economics? Um, to be honest, I don't know the legality of it, but I don't believe there's this being Texas and you're owning your own land and nobody better tell you what to do with your land. Uh, I think probably, um, and, and are, maybe Bridget, do you or, or, or does anybody else know, is there any kind of uh, federal protection afforded to um, basically essential wetlands that are part of the migratory flyways or in the government? Does the government, the federal government, for example, buy a wetland if you will protect it, kind of like they do some forested areas? I really don't know. But I, I do know that was a common and is a common practice. You know, it, again, it's one of those situations where, um, you know, as you've got increasing mechanization, you don't want to be plowing around uh, areas necessarily. Russ, wetlands are protected, but there's, there's certain definitions to be a federally protected wetlands, and, and it's, it's fairly rigorous. Uh, but, and there are on, on, on private property. Right. Okay. But but it, but it still has to, be, has to meet the legal definition. And there, okay. there are there are programs from the from the feds and the state that help can where landowners can get funding to That's, maintain their thing. For example, the Welder Flats area and the Welder Ranch out of Sea Drift has lots of conservation easements and programs where they've maintained that for the whooping crane benefit. Yeah, thank you. I, I, I thought there was a. a program that would pay you to leave them the way they are, knowing full well they're interfering with your primary business, which is row crop agriculture. And I think um, the Obama administration had uh, fairly significantly expanded um, what was uh, controlled um, on a wetland basis um, beyond just some of the primary waterways and um, they expanded it to uh, more uh, tributaries, upstream tributaries. And, and that um, was subsequently rolled back fairly significantly by uh, the Trump administration. So, um, you know, some of that kind of goes back and forth depending upon who's in power. Yeah, I, I, again, I remember back years ago when when uh, they, even before Obama, they expanded the uh, definition of, of, I don't know if it's wetlands, but it had to be navigable. You had to be able to get a boat of some sort, even if it was a canoe, uh, up, up an area for it to be included in the designation of an open body of water. But then they changed that as well. So. Anyway, um, so we're not sure <laughs> where that stands right now, but. Um, the most recent, it, it, it's the, the looser regulations are in place now as a result of the Trump administration has rolled back a lot of the protections that some of this court case, some of it was court tested and some of it was just changes in, in the way the EPA yeah. regulated. But, yeah. But I just okay. feel like Thank don't, you. it's not all big aggro because a lot of those okay. algal blooms that are caused in your bay is from your neighbor's NPK rolling off their green, green country club lawns and stuff. It's not just, you know, right. there's local problems that are yes. causing it too. Look, little, little Bay and Rock Course is a good example of that. Yeah, yep. I mean. Yeah, you're right. Everybody's lawn. It's your mess. It's some, a lot of times it's our mess that sure. we, you know, that we and our neighbors have. 
Yeah. We got and a I, chance to start over now, though. Everything's and dead. I, I'm glad you I'm glad you brought that up because that that actually was was an answer to one of one of her questions was what can we do to um, tell your neighbors improve our estuaries yeah. and and that's something we can personally do is is uh, not be so um, good lord. Um, Willy nilly with the application of, of fertilizer and particularly with uh, pesticides. Everybody wants a, a weed free lawn, and those are much more damaging to me. Fertilizers transient and cause an algal bloom for a day, but those pesticides are pretty long lived. Okay. Do we Thank have you. any other questions for Russ? I do have one, but I don't know, I don't want to take all the time, but I, it, he covered a little bit in one of the videos about the Laguna Madre, so I was more interested in, um, you, you were talking about the shallow nature and the evaporation making the hypersalinity and that it being, you know, a really rare phenomenon, so what I, what we were talking about is what caused that. Why is it like that? And why is it that it's there and nowhere else? Because like a lot of the things that we have other places like North Carolina duplicates, for example, what, what made that? What causes it to stay that way? Okay, well, basically, you know, saw on the first slide, the formation of the barrier islands. And, and that, that's pretty much um, the way it was when it, when it finally stabilized and formed, you know, couple hundred years ago, it, it was relatively shallow and still is. Uh, it's got an intercoastal waterway that runs through it. Uh, it's, it's 14 feet deep, but it's only, what, three or 400 yards wide. And um, <clears throat> the important thing is two things. One, it's, it's in that desert belt that I referenced. So it doesn't get a lot of rainfall, either on the coast or inland. And there's no rivers other than the Rio Grande, which only, only flows about once every other year. Um, so all of those combined with the extremely dry, sunny days that we get, particularly throughout the summer, which means evaporation far exceeds uh, precipitation and, and runoff and, and river input, which is why you end up with the, with the hypersalinity as a, as a permanent um, condition. So, but no, are you saying that less actual fresh water from the sky falls into that area for yes. some reason? Yes, because it's in that convergence area from those three oh, big I got atmospheric you. cells. Okay, yeah, yeah, it's yeah. It's a yeah. high, anytime, watch the news in the evening that they say we're going to have really great weather for the next week. They're going to say because a high pressure system mm -hmm, I got that. moving in. So, so will it eventually fill in by those three processes that you were talking about? Uh, it, it's going to be a while before it fills in because uh, there's nothing to wash sediment into it other than just okay uh, runoff from surrounding uh, land, and that's all sandy area. Uh, so that sand's not going to going to wash in and settle out like like clay particles from okay. more inland upland areas. You, you do actually, uh, one thing that's interesting about Laguna Madre is it's, it's actually divided into the northern and southern uh, lagunas. And uh, the reason there's a separation is it's not sediment that's been washed in, it's sediment that's been blown in. So there are these aeolian, um, but, uh, by that, I mean wind-blown sand deposits that are filling in the laguna more than river flood-type deposits. Yep, okay. yep, you're, yep, exactly right. Uh, fortunately, that's not happening real fast because since that's a national seashore, there's no development, residential development. So those dunes, which is the source of that sand you're referring to, keep keep most of it in place uh, against hurricanes. One hurricane will, will move stuff around more than 10 years of, of normal wind. So um, yeah, you're right that you got the northern and the southern and the lower lagoon uh, with a that intercoastal waterway runs through the through the middle of that land bridge, if you will. 
Appreciate it. Okay, any other questions for Russ? It's not a question, but it's an observation. Okay. It seems that we as a society have a split personality when it comes to uh, soil erosion on waterfronts. Um, and we seem to take great exception when bluffs erode or when uh, hurricanes come along and uh, blow buildings down that are very adjacent to the coast. Uh, it seems to me that we spend a lot of time, effort, resources on trying to restore many of those areas after harm has been done that mother nature on, uh, on her own uh, self-management is going to erode anyway and and it seems to me there needs to be a reassessment of how we go about that part of what we do as people trying to maintain our ecology. Couldn't, couldn't agree more with you. <clears throat> and um, just to add briefly to that, I, I lived in, uh, in Port Aransas for about 35 years before I moved, moved to Corpus. And, you know, Hurricane Harvey just did an absolute devastating number there and I was talking to a, a real estate woman right after that and I said boy I guess you're going to be looking for another job she said oh god no she said I got more business now than I ever had before um and and, and sure enough I <laughs> I go up there occasionally and I've never seen so much new construction going up uh now I will say instead of your typical beach houses that were built you know back in the in the 30s and 40s, like I lived in, um, everybody's putting them up on on stilts now, on pile, or, you know, raising raising the pilings up to about uh, oh god, 12, 15 feet. But again, it's a it's just a disaster waiting to happen. <laughs> I agree with you. People think they're doing, and they are in a sense doing the right thing, but. No, the right thing would not not be to build in an area like that. I guess as long as the insurance claims, you know, keep getting paid, people are going to continue to build. Well, and and that's a good point because the National Flood Protection Program, you know, just about anyone can get flood insurance anywhere, and there's stories about what are you know kind of really modest homes that have been covered by flood after flood after flood after flood so if you look at the the, the cumulative value of that property there it's millions of dollars for yeah. modest homes just Pretty because much. they've been um covered so many times over and over yes sir yeah. right yeah well i think there's I thought that there was some new federal guidelines on on um, delineation of, of areas that, particularly along the coast, that were were um, likely to, to uh, have a hurricane uh, at some time, and that um, either your your rates were outrageously high, or you couldn't even get it unless you we're at a certain elevation, but again, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not sure that's in effect or not. I thought they were talking about it because I thought the same thing as you, Matt. That's <laughs> a, a million dollars of, of multiple homes in the same location. And we're all paying for it. Any other questions for us? Or comments. Well, thank you all for your attention and thank you all for the kind words that you had to say about the uh, video presentation.
Appreciate Very that, good, buddy. Russ. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, well, I'm going to stick around if I, if you don't mind. Oh, absolutely not. Um, so the and, next... and, and Bridget, can I interject one thing? I guess mm -hmm. if, if people come up with some other questions, you know, by all means, you know, submit them. And, and I'm sure Russ would be happy to address some of those questions more like in an email format than, than just a verbal format. I certainly would. And I would welcome that. I think, I think my email address is on that video somewhere beginning. Yes. Yep. Yeah. yeah. I put it, I put it on every single one of them. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> okay, so the next part of the program tonight, I um, am going to give a presentation about um, wetlands. So, you know, Russ started out as a bigger component where he talked about watersheds, estuaries, and this is a slightly different topic. It's wetlands. And so I'm going to give you a presentation about wetlands and then go specifically into the type of wetland that we'll be seeing um, on Saturday. Um, so let me share my screen. Okay, can you all see my uh, presentation here? Yes, I can. Okay, so sure I can go forward here. Uh -huh. Why can't I go forward? Ah, oh, there we go. Okay. So here we go. I like to ask questions in my presentation. And so I want you all to unmute and answer what is a wetland? Pretty basic stuff. Anybody? We're just shouting it out. It's, a river. it's it where out. the river, it's always sometimes wet and it's where the river comes uh, out into the ocean, maybe, possibly. Yeah. Anybody else have something else about it? Would it be something that doesn't dry up? It's not ephemeral. It's, it, there's always water in it. Well, maybe. Actually, it's, it's not, it's not, it's, it's not, that's not a requirement. And you, you'll see that in a minute that it is wet part of the time, but um, it is land, sim simply stating it is land that is wet. However, it's uh, the transition zone between land and water, but it doesn't have to be wet all the time. There are wetlands that dry up and then flood and dry up and flood. Um, and we'll see the different types here. So there's inland wetlands and there's coastal wetlands. So inland wetlands are freshwater wetlands. There's rivers and floodplains. So a floodplain is a type of wetland where you see it's not, you know, you've got the river and the river channel, right? And the river uh, carved this channel, but when it floods, it's gonna go out of those banks and that's known as a wetland too. So it's not wet all the time. Um, and then there are swamps. Those are all inland wetlands. So here's, I like to give questions. So first question, what type of plants dominate and defines a swamp, the term swamp. We use it loosely. Moss. Moss. Anybody else? Trees. Trees. Anybody else? Ferns. Ferns. Lily pads. Lily pads. Okay. Well, mangroves. The answer is trees. So uh, wetland is dominated by trees. And uh, this is a picture of Cato Lake, which I love. I love kayaking up there. But it is a uh, wetland dominated by trees is a, the definition of a swamp. Yeah, somebody is in the background uh, talking. 
mute your there we go okay so the other type of wetlands are coastal and so we have estuaries which ross has wonderfully talked about in his videos and then we have salt marsh which is what we're going to see at um, boggy on saturday uh, the estuary, like Carla mentioned, is where fresh water meets salt water. It is where the river meets the ocean. Um, this is a picture of the major uh, river basins and bays and streams. And uh, I, Russ talked about this too. But I have to show you this picture because uh, I just think it's a kind of a beautiful representation of the watersheds of Texas. and. Um, this fella, um, he, he has this company called Grasshopper Geography, Ge Geography and um, I, he produces these for a lot of the states. And I thought this was just gorgeous, but it shows the river watersheds. And you can kind of see on the mid coast here where the waters uh, originate and where they come into the Gulf, the Gulf there. So here's question number two. On what bay is Boggy Nature Park? So here's Boggy, here's Port O'Connor. You'll be coming in 185. Here's Port O'Connor. Do you all know what bay this is? Matagorda Bay. Matagorda Bay, correct. Okay, bonus points. Uh, what about this bay here that's in between Matagorda Island? And the mainland here, Port O'Connor and Seadrift. Anybody? West Bay? Not West Bay. West Bay, West Matagorda Bay is this one. Uh, off the map is East Matagorda Bay. It's actually, um, there's kind of a land bridge here that separates East Matagorda and West Matagorda. You can see my pointer, right? St. Charles? San Antonio. No, it's a Spanish name. It is oh, a Spanish Presidio. name. But I can't remember. Uh, um, uh, Presidio? It, it begins with an E. Espirito Santo? Espirito Santo Bay. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. Yep. And then this bay here is San Antonio Bay. That's the one I thought it was. I would like to suggest, this is for Russ. I changed my mind about Russ. Russ, can you change all the names to where the bays and the rivers and the estuaries match? <laughs> <laughs> it's not so stinking hard. I, I, I could, but it would be wrong. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, because you see the, um, like, let's take San Antonio Bay, for example. The San Antonio River does flow into this bay, but the major river is the Guadalupe. Uh, so they meet, and then they both flow. Uh, the San Antonio flows into Guadalupe, and then they both go into San Antonio Bay. So it's it's complicated, as yeah. most things are. I think right. they actually call it the Guadalupe Estuary, yeah. which is equal to San Antonio Bay, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but the estuaries are typically named after the rivers that 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 bring the that they drain into. Yeah. Okay. So so when you come on Saturday, you're going to come to this boggy nature park and uh, the uh, land area that is outlined in yellow here is uh, boggy uh, bayou nature park. Um, and it is a county, Calhoun County Park. Um, you see here it's on Matagorda Bay. It has a shoreline to Matagorda Bay. And then this we call Boggy Bayou or Boggy Lake. And then the bayou actually flows all the way up here. And you can see here's a larger scale picture. And if you follow, you can see my pointer, right? Yep. Okay. So you can follow it all the way up. And when you all come in on 185, you're going to be crossing uh, now it's all kind of vegetated over and sometimes you can see the water, a little bit of water, sometimes you can't. It's, it's before the community center in the bank. And then this is what it looks like when you're driving down the road. So if you see this utility pole and these, um, this little fence here, that's going to be the 
uh, Boggy Creek. And then here's just a, a drone view. When you're coming in 185 here, you're going to turn. I think the directions told you to turn on 7th Street or you can come down to 2nd Street. Uh, you have to take either one because there's this big uh, piece of undeveloped property, which is yay, um, and you have to go around it, but the, it's down here, okay? Um, so, foggy is a salt marsh, and salt marshes are flooded by uh, the tides. They're drained and flooded, okay? They just have this cyclical flow. It has a very specific and special ecosystem, which, uh, uh, you know, Russ really talked about a lot of the critters um, and their life cycles, which is wonderful. Um, I am going to uh, just talk a little bit about the whole system of this saltwater wetland. And it kind of begins with the soil type. The soil is called hydric which means it's wet. It is wet soil. Um, and because it's wet most of the time, there's very little oxygen in it. And that uh, hydrophytic plants grow in this type of soil. They're water loving plants. That's what hydrophytic means, water loving plants. So they adapted to this kind of environment. And their water tolerance determines where they're going to be found. So when you come to Boggy on Saturday, we're going to do an exercise uh, with the specific plants. And we'll locate plants in all of these uh, different areas. Um, you will be seeing these terms. If you do any more reading or studying about wetlands, you'll see these terms, facultative upland, facultative, facultative wetland, and uh, obligate. So obligate means that it likes to have its feet wet. Uh, upland means that it can tolerate it sometimes, but not all the time. So that's what determines where these plants will grow. If the sea level rises, which we, you know, climate people say that is supposed to happen, a lot of these plants that, uh, well, the plants that are down here that are obligate are just going to be covered over all the time. And these plants that just like to be wet some of the time might die away. So changes might happen. Uh, so it's all about location, 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 where the plant grows. Uh, in reference to the water. Another uh, feature of these plants, because it's a salt marsh, is that they're haliophilic, which means that they like salt, or at least they're adapted to salt. They're adapted in several different ways. And on Saturday, we're going to do an exercise and we're going to talk about how these plants each adapt to the, the salt, uh, high salinity. Uh, some secrete it, some store it, some block it up from intake. Um, but we're going to look at some of these specific plants that are out there. So the wetland plants serve uh, lots of different functions. Um, they serve for preventing erosion because their root system goes down into that uh, soil. Um, they actually sequester carbon by taking that out of the environment and putting it down into the mud. They protect uh, from storm surge. Um, and of course, lots of critters, the critters that specifically live in this marshland, they hide in it, they feed in it, they breed in it. And so these plants are extremely important. It's an, it's, uh, these plants provide us ecosystem services. Okay, I just love this slide because it shows so much and uh, I wish I could give you all a copy of this because if you look very closely, you'll see the different species that, that uh, live in the wetlands. I'm just going to go over, Russ talked about several different life cycles in the estuary. I'm going to talk just briefly about some of the species very specific to the salt marsh 
And some of these we'll be seeing uh, when you come on Saturday. So this periwinkle snail, it has a special relationship with the cord grass. You see it here and we'll see it when we go out there. Um, and we'll talk about that when we get there. And Eastern oysters, they live out there in Boggy. And I usually um, harvest a clump of them and put them in a container for you guys to see not only, um, and then I put water in it and you will see how clear that water gets, how they filter that water, but also they are a micro habitat all themselves. They have different um, marine organisms growing on them, living within them, and they're just a remarkable uh, little ecosystem all in themselves. Uh, the crustaceans of the salt marsh include the hermit crab, the fiddler crab, and the grass shrimp. So uh, uh, Captain Whitney with the Texas Floating Classroom will be there and she'll be dragging a seine and you'll get to help her pick out of the seine net uh, organisms like this uh, grass shrimp um, that live out in the marsh there. We'll be talking about the fiddler crab and we'll be seeing hermit crabs as well. Um, some of the reptiles, which I don't think we'll be seeing that uh, act, but they do live in a salt marsh, a very specific, um, the Gulf salt marsh snake. Um, this here, when we took our training in 2007, uh, these are the hands of Doc McAllister. And he's, uh, he and his wife, Martha, we consider uh, the grandparents of our chapter. They taught many, many classes on the Barrier Island and at Aransas National Wildlife Refuge. And when we were out there on the Barrier Island and uh, we just, he found this right there at the dock and he just goes over and picks it up and shows it to us. But that is a snake that lives in the salt marsh. This is my favorite turtle. Um, the diamondback terrapin, and they are the only turtle that live in the salt marsh. So you see, it is a terrestrial turtle. You can see because it doesn't have flippers, it's not a sea turtle, it has claws, but uh, it lives in that salt marsh. It buries itself and it lays its eggs right there in that salt water marsh uh, mud. Um, and it's a beautiful turtle. I just love its skin, how it's white and polka dotted. And then these raised uh, parts of its carapace is why it's called the diamondback. Um, then there are insects specific to the salt marsh as well. There's lots of insects out there. This one dragon I found, uh, I, I, I can't say that I've noticed it out there, but it should be because I looked at iNaturalist and um, people have documented it all along the Gulf Coast. And the females are this uh, yellow color, which is kind of different. Uh, you know, usually the males are brighter, but in this case, the males are a darker color and the females are yellow, but they live and put their eggs into the salt water. And this is a uh, salt marsh moth. They are found in the salt water, but it's not just specific to the salt marsh. They do, um, they do plant their eggs in, in little colonies, as you see here, in other types of vegetation as well. But you will find them in the salt marsh. And they're named salt marsh. Of course, uh, Alan's going to tell you on Saturday about um, more of the salt marsh birds, and these are just a few. Of course, we know about the whooping crane that comes in winters with us. Um, there's a little sparrow called the Nelson's sharp tail, and when they winter with us, uh, they love to, to be out in this salt marsh. And breeding birds here, we have birds that are residents, and they breed here, the red-winged blackbird, and here's a picture that I took. Uh, Alan and I have a volunteer project that we do with the Gulf Coast Bird Observatory. And um, we monitor oyster catchers and nesting. But one uh, location over by Indianola, instead of oyster catchers, I found this clapper rail. 
And hopefully maybe when we're out at Boggy, we'll, we'll hear them because you often hear them. But these, it had three babies you can see here. It was so sweet. But they breed in the salt marsh. Of course, the mammals, uh, we don't like the feral hogs, but they get in there. And then we have coyotes, raccoons, deer. Um, and so it is like what uh, wet uh, rest told us it is a very complex food web. So here's our final question. Uh, what ecosystem <laughs> services do wetlands provide? Any of these? All of these. All of them. All of these. Right, right. It's all of these. Right. Okay, so to uh, conclude, I like to have fun and I want to share with you, um, this is a fella who's on the internet and uh, some people think it's juvenile, but I just think it's fun. So I just want you to sit back and enjoy this little video uh, and listen to the words because he's really doing a great job of explaining. Uh-oh. I absolutely love teaching. Sorry. We're going to skip this uh, ad here. Uh, but listen to the words. He does a great job of explaining what a wetland is. If I can get it to unmute. Uh-oh. There we go. What a task, better look fast. I bet you never heard a rap from a bird of grass. Yeah, I'm a reed, reed is my name. You're gonna be digging me next time we get a lot of rain. Me and my cousin, we soak up a whole lot of water, keeping things balanced like I live out on a tinder totter. Our roots go down in the spongy mud like a game of Red Rover. We're holding back a mighty flood. Come on out and visit, canoe through. You're gonna see a Santa tall waving at you. Oh, yeah. Alright, here we go. We're living in a wet land, a wet land, a wet land. <laughs> right there where the water meets the dry, dry land. We're living in a wet land, a wet land, a wet land. Talking about all the herons, alligators, and clams. Oh, hold it, man. I am a friend. My name is Sam, Sam, and I am. I put the water in through my snorkel eyes now. Then I filter out the photos and I spit the water out. I'm eating plants and those little plants and critters. I'm floating in the water, teeny it tiny like glitter. A poison's in the water, hurts the humans and the otters. So I have a heart to do my part like a Noah otter. I store pollution now in my inside. Feeding up the water through the low and the high tide. Low tide.
And I want you to notice where this is filmed. Uh, it is local. It is the Texas coast. Uh, so that's another reason why I loved it, is that is so pertinent for that's us. That's it. Uh, so we're going to see you on Saturday in one of the most productive ecosystems in the world, just like rainbow Ooh. and coral reefs. So, uh, any questions about wetlands that I can answer? My usual question, what kind of footwear should we take? Oh, wait, I have a poll. I have a poll <laughs> question for that. Let me, um, let me see, how do I do this poll? What now? is the appropriate <laughs> items to wear for Saturdays? <laughs> Boots that can get muddy. Okay, that's good to know. All right. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Did you so put somebody, that? Somebody Team Speedo. Team Speedo. You, know. Team Speedo. <laughs> yeah. you know who it is, Bridget? Uh, yeah. <laughs> right. Um, in the Speedo and Bridget in the bikini. We we've got. We're. Tw I'm a 2020 year. We've got to live now. Okay. <laughs> there you go. Well, I'll tell you. The reason not to wear a speedo or a bikini is called mosquitoes. <laughs> yeah, because mosquitoes. the weather forecast it's going to be warm and, and possibly sunny, maybe cloudy, but the wind is what <laughs> determines how many mosquitoes bother you. And the wind isn't going to be so brisk; it's going to be a little bit, uh, but. You might want to bring some bug spray with you. And that's another reason to wear long sh sleeve shirt, pants, um, because for mosquito protection, not only sun protection, but so here's our answers. <laughs> <laughs> some people, two people are going to wear Speedo. <laughs> Speedos yeah. and bikinis. Um, let's see. Okay, before we sign off, don't forget to send me your questions, email. Thank you, Russ. Thank you, Russ. Okay.